So what is the triple digit ROI formula and why do you care? The triple digit ROI formula is something that I've kind of designed to basically prove a model in real estate where you basically can't fail. Now, triple digit ROI is what we're after, meaning 100% or greater return on investment or ROI. So the capital you invest, you wanna get all that capital back and double your money. Hey everyone, Mike Brosart here from the at home boardroom office talking to you guys today about the triple digit ROI formula. I would love it if you shared this video and hit the little subscribe button right at the bottom right. That'd be a huge, awesome thing. And the thumbs up would be great. Thank you so much. So what is the triple digit ROI formula and why do you care? The triple digit ROI formula is something that I've kind of designed to basically prove a model in real estate where you basically can't fail. Now, the triple digit ROI formula relies on a few individual factors. As you can tell from the title, triple digit ROI is what we're after. Triple digit meaning 100% or greater return on investment or ROI. So the capital you invest, you wanna get all that capital back and double your money. And I did this on almost every single real estate deal that I've ever done um, if I followed these key strategies. And the reason this formula is so good is because it's designed to weather a recession. It's designed for someone to pick up this formula and say, okay, in a down market, I'm still going to make money. So what are some of the components of the triple digit ROI formula and why is it so attractive? Well, for one, the triple digit ROI formula focuses first and foremost on cash flow. Now everyone's talking on, you, you, know, you, talk, you follow a lot of the, the YouTubers on, on a lot of channels to talk about real estate. Everyone's focused on cash flow, but everyone has different versions of what cash flow means. And I was at a recent meetup and I was talking to some people about what cash flow means to them. And investors in Toronto, Vancouver, California, a lot of them say $150 a door net cash flow is good. They're like, man, that's a cash flowing property. But to me, 400, 450, 500 dollars even a door net cash flow is what we're actually after. And when I talk about investing for cash flow, I'm talking about buying properties that meet minimum the 1% rule, ideally the 2% rule, if you're airbnb the 3% rule. Now what does that mean? That means that the, I wanna get back one to 3% of the purchase price, total purchase price of the property each and every month in rent. Now that can be difficult to do. I'm not gonna say that the triple digit ROI formula is easy. You're gonna to have to work really hard to find properties that fit the triple digit ROI model. And you're gonna to have to work really hard to unlock value as we go through because there are several components. So like I said, the first component of the triple digit ROI formula is cash flow. And ideally, to make the cash flow good, you have to be borrowing cheaply. This formula actually works the best between one and four units. So I find anything less than six units, ideally. So less than six, you can get residential mortgages, which typically are around three to three and a half percent fixed five-year interest rates. That's important. If you're borrowing at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent, you cannot get a triple digit ROI in the, as easily or as safely and conservatively as you could with cheap debt. So cheap debt is very, very important cornerstone of this strategy. So one, you gotta have cheap debt. Two, you gotta buy properties that cash flow well. So let me give you some examples. Here in London, Ontario, you might buy a $200,000 property that's gonna rent for $2,500 to $3,000 a month. That's ideal. A $300,000 property here is gonna rent for $3,500. You know, a, a $500,000 property here in London, Ontario, Canada is going to need to rent for around $6,500 to $7,000 a month for it to really make good sense. Now, the, when I'm looking for a metric for cash flow, not only am I looking at a gross for the property, but I'm also looking at a net. So the reason we start at gross for based on the property size is some people are buying in cash or buying with different down payments. So if you buy it 20% down, 5% down, 25% down, 50% down, depending on the variation of basically split to bank financing to your own capital will cause different variations in the rate of return you're going to get because invested capital is the most important piece in return. So ideally with this strategy, you're gonna lever up with cheap residential debt. And it's the reason I partner with investors and I don't buy properties myself because I can't go to the banks anymore. Now that, you know, once you have a dozen properties, it's very difficult to go to the bank and say, hey, can I get a mortgage at 3% fixed? The bank's going to say, you're at your limit now. Um, you need to go into the commercial arm. You have so many doors and so many properties. We don't wanna lend you residential mortgages. We want you to have commercial type mortgages, which come at a 1% premium. It's the reason that I don't agree with Grant Cardone when he talks about buying multifamily. 
Single family has been my bread and butter and it performs as a percentage way better than commercial real estate. Residential cash flows, net cash flow, much, much better. Well, you've seen in my other videos why I talk about residential real estate versus commercial real estate. Just to give you a quick 10 second synopsis. Um, insurance is much lower on residential properties. Um, taxes are better. There's less complex corporate structures, legal, accounting, administrative. Um, property management tends to be more expensive in multifamily. The biggest one though is property taxes. In my municipality, the same cost valued property, right? A $500,000 multifamily and a $500,000 residential property, both of them could theoretically rent for the same amount. They have the same rent roll. I've looked at duplexes with 12 bedrooms in them that cash flow as well as in a good area in London, that cash flow as well as a 12 plex. And these properties can sell for the exact same amount, cash flow just the exact same, but net cash flow, right? At, after all the expenses would be significantly different because a 12 plex property has triple the property tax bill. In some cases, 12, 15,000 in annual property taxes, whereas that residential property would have a 4,000, 5,000 annual property tax bill because the mill rate, the rate for commercial property taxes is much higher in London, Ontario. And that's the case in many different municipalities and cities in Canada and the United States. So commercial real estate, not only is that, but the interest financing cost way, way higher. So a lot of downsides to commercial real estate, but the deals are big and you can still make a great spread. You can still apply this type of formula on commercial real estate. But again, I, I really advocate your first 10 deals should be residential. It's a lot easier, it's a lot safer, a lot more exit strategies, more recession proof. Number of reasons why I think this model works better with residential, because the rate of return is higher. So you're looking for cash flow. You're also gonna get a bit of mortgage pay down, which is fantastic. Uh, that's all built into the calculation. I look for 25% cash on cash return with typically 20 to 25% down payment. So that right there, you're getting your down payment back in three to four years. That's there's no appreciation and we didn't buy smart. But of course, this is a triple digit ROI formula. So the second piece, second most important and almost as important as the first is arbitraging. You need to be buying smart. A lot of people, they get a C realtor or a B minus realtor, a really not great realtor. And it's really easy to find not great realtors. Um, you'll find lots of them in almost every market. Uh, a good percentage of them are just salespeople. They don't have the background as analysts. They don't have the background to run the numbers and they aren't invested in your interests. They wanna see the property sell and they wanna see it sell for the most possible because it's selling on realtor.ca or MLS. So to arbitrage a property, what does that mean? Arbitrage means you are basically buying an underutilized asset and then realizing some sort of value, putting it back up for and unlocking that value. Typically when we arbitrage, it's because a bad agent didn't write a good listing description, bad photos are another great reason we could get a property under, undervalued. We could often grab properties that need renovation and the market said the market's valuing said renovation at 30,000 when it is really a $10,000 renovation. So there's $20,000 in arbitrage. We can also negotiate very, very hard and firm with, you know, no conditions. I, I was the, you know, back in 2014, I was doing no conditions offers when everyone else was putting in financing and building inspection. I was getting in there with my crew and doing it all in one shot, putting in nice firm offers, getting significant discounts on properties, even on the MLS because of my strategy. So you can, you, there are terms, right? There are other things that are more important sometimes to the seller than price. Price isn't everything. Um, in fact, in a lot of cases, it's not the deciding factor. I get deals all the time when my offers are less because my conditions are better. My closing conditions, my financing conditions, I don't have any of those, right? And I close quickly. There are other factors too that, that come into play like assuming bad tenants. Some people want vacant possession. I'll go ahead and take those headaches and get a significant discount. So when we talk about arbitraging, what goes hand in hand with arbitrage, like buying properties undervalued and then unlocking that value is adding value. So value add, very, very important. Cash flowing, arbitraging and value adding. What I mean by value adding is if you have a property that has under market rents, which is pretty much every property where the tenant has been there longer than two years in, in my market, longer than a year actually. If they've been there longer than a year, you want the tenant out because they're paying old rents. Rents have gone up about 20% here in London, Ontario. And a lot of people still don't know that. So what that means is there's a ton of arbitrage opportunity. You buy a triplex, say it's rented each unit for 500, 500 and 500 and market rents are 800, 800 and 800. Just by removing that tenant, each tenant that leaves, you add tens of thousands in value to that property because properties that are geared to investors trade on NOI. They sell based on net operating income. So it's very, very important you get that net operating income as high as you possibly can. So that's a really good value add strategy getting rid of 
underpaying tenants and putting in better paying tenants. Often at the same time, I'll combine it with another value add, which is renovating the property to a certain standard for the neighborhood and for the tenant profile. Now in a B neighborhood, I might go B plus on the renovation to get that quality tenant. In an A neighborhood, I'll go A renovation level. In a C neighborhood, I'll probably still go B minus on the renovation, right? On the quality of the finishes that I put into this property. And I will always renovate below market costs. So if the market values renovation at say 10,000 for a unit, I'll try to do it from five to 6,000 so I can get the spread as a value add. The difference between what I put into the property and what the market values I put into the property. That difference goes right into the triple digit ROI formula. Of course, when you're buying smart, you're gonna have several different areas where you're gonna be able to add value. Typically, landscaping can add a ton of value. Better listing pictures. I've seen people buy properties, do nothing to them, take really good listing pictures, get a great agent to list the property, and make 10, 20, 30% return on their money. That's something super easy you can do. So many agents don't hire good photographers to take really good pictures of the listing that really represent the space for what it is, right? You need to make sure that you make it look even bigger than it is, um, not just exactly what it is. And oftentimes they will leave out golden nuggets. Like I'll go into a property and see it as a second kitchen. They omitted that in the listing description and in the pictures. That adds a lot of value in my market, uh, having those extra bedrooms or that extra square footage that is not specifically represented by the listing. Also, tons of dumb stuff agents do like listing a four bedroom property is a two bedroom property, omitting the listing of a, a bedroom, missed listing, certain pieces, all those things basically knock it out of the search criteria. So when buyers are on MLS or realtor.ca searching for said property, they won't see it, right? Or maybe it's priced $5,000 too high and no one's seeing it because it's just priced slightly too high. And you get in there because it's a stale listing and you negotiate it down to a really good price. Of course, a lot of deals in the triple digit ROI formula come from wholesalers and private off market. I buy a lot of my deals not on realtor.ca, um, ones that are pocket listings where the agent hasn't quite put it on Realtor.ca yet. Ones where they're a wholesale agreement and I pay the wholesaler a fee to assign the deal to me. Ones where I go out myself and I knock on doors or talk to people on my network and I grab the deals right off Craigslist, right off Kijiji, right in the you know, Facebook marketplace. They're all over the place. These deals are there to be grabbed and to be taken advantage of. So the third and sorry, the fourth piece of advice I'm going to talk about is speculation. It needs to be the least important thing. You don't want to bet on market appreciation, but it's going to happen. There will be appreciation at least at the rate of inflation. Real estate has to keep up with inflation or better. So there should be like around 3% growth each and every year um, for speculation though. If you want to do speculation right, and you're going to try to line all your ducks up in a row for a nice, um, you know, knock all the pins down, good, good strike or something, if you're going for a bowling analogy, uh, what you'd want to do is line up for gentrification. Now, I don't look for this you know, as my first, second, or third reason to buy a property. And that's why people say, do you have a favorite area in London, Mike? I have like six favorite areas, but I will buy anywhere in London because this model works in any market. You buy the best cash flowing properties you can find, those top 10% unicorn properties. You buy the best arbitrage value you can find and you add value in the best way possible. So in California, renovations are much more expensive. People are spending 50, 60, $70,000 on houses. If you can find a way to do that renovation for 30 or 40,000 by, you know, getting good material costs, getting good labor costs, and just being really, really efficient on cost control, you could add a ton of value. So even in those markets, people talk to me like, you know, how do you make money in, in New York or, or California? You know, I do agree it is a harder to make good money when you can't cash flow the way you can in London, but there is still a way to get the maximum return that you can. And the triple digit ROI formula that I follow here in London, Ontario is one based, of course, on cash flow and arbitrage and value add. And then lastly, gentrification. So speculation is basically your you're gambling in a lot of ways. You're betting on the market improving. You are not in control. I mean, you could, you could theoretically, I would argue if you were a developer in an area and you were developing the whole subdivision, then you would go from being a speculator almost to an arbitrager because you're the one adding the value. You're in control. But most people don't have their hand in the back pocket of the city. Most people don't have actual control over whether or not uh, the neighborhood is going to be gentrified or not, unless they're buying all the houses there. And that's a strategy I've used before too. I bought several on the same street, sold one as a comp, and I controlled the comparables from properties on my street. As soon as I sold one for 300, all my ones I bought for 200 were now worth 300. You have full control. So now to give you an example, I'm gonna finish this video with a quick example of, this is gonna be a bit of a longer video, with an example of a real triple digit ROI formula type property. So. Let me just pick one here. Um, okay, we got, I got one we, we just closed on in, in August, right? 2018, people are thinking it's impossible to, to do this, um, get these properties in this market. I'm, 
I've done a dozen of them now when people are saying it's not possible. Bought, bought property, call it $225,000 purchase price roughly for easy numbers. Triplex type property, you know, uh, we had to put in different tenants, get the rents up a little bit, but within 30 days of owning it, we didn't spend hardly anything, like nothing on renovations. We brought an appraiser into the property and the property appraised at $325,000. So we can get put a mortgage on it for 265, right? Bought it for around 225, 230, you know, closing costs, whatever. So the spread is so large on this property that from day 30, after putting almost no capital in, we've pulled out with a refinance, 80% loan to value. We've created $100,000 in equity. The down payment is negative $35,000 within 30 days of closing. In that sort of scenario, the ROI is infinite. This is an example where ROI is infinite. When your invested capital is zero or less, your ROI is infinite. So there is no uh, ROI on this. It just goes for infinity because we have zero dollars invested. We're getting great cash flow. Now this property can rent for around $4,000 a month. We bought for $225,000. Uh, thousand. It has the potential in London here, in East London, to rent for about $4,000 a month, and we're going to do that. We're going to get it all fixed up, spend $20,000, renovate it, make it nice. But it was great on close to grab a $325,000 appraisal, pull out all the capital, have negative $35,000 in the property. Now imagine if, if that hadn't happened. Imagine if we got an appraisal for you know, two seventy five, dollars which would be the really lowest end possible. We would still be at almost nothing in the property. You got your whole down payment back. With the triple digit ROI formula, I buy to arbitrage. So on day one, on the day of close, you should have doubled your down payment. That's the starting point, right? 20% down a $225,000 house is like $50,000. So if you can get your $50,000 back, you've already doubled your money. You're already at 100% ROI. Now, $4,000 a month, once we get the tenants out, get proper cash flow on this property, get proper market rents, and get the cash flow really pumping, this $225,000, $230,000 property is going to cash flow over $2,000 a month one property, right? So you get your down payment back, let's do the math, in two years, get your 50,000 back again. There's 200% ROI. Now there's gonna be appreciation, there's gonna be you know, more upside than we, we had officially expected. That's where you can get into really high return on investment by buying very, very smart. So that's the video for today, guys, talking about triple digit ROI. I'm gonna do some future videos where I walk through real deals just like this, because I think people like to understand the layouts, understand what we bought, why we bought it, and where the headspace was at as we went through these deals. And I'm hoping that's gonna add some value to your guys' life. I would love to hear in the comments if you find the triple digit ROI formula to be valuable, if you thought there was nuggets or pieces of information in here that you want to take with you. Um, I'd love to hear in the comments if you're enacting certain pieces of this strategy. Are you buying for cash flow? Are you arbitraging properties? How are you adding value to your real estate portfolio? How are you adding value to your investments? Do you think real estate is a great investment vehicle or are you sticking to public equities and saying, hey, you know what? I don't want the stress of real estate. I just want to invest in public equities and that's cool. I just want to reach fire. At the end of the day, real estate is a means to an end and I, I love the game, so I just can't help myself, but most people are using real estate as a vehicle to unlock something and most of us are looking after financial independence. So there it is, guys. That's the video for today. Tell me what you guys think. If you're still watching this video now towards the end and I've captivated you all the way through, I need to hear that at the bottom. That motivates the hell out of me because it just makes me want to make more videos. What do you think of the backdrop? Do you like that we've got the fireplace and the brick that I got, I'm shooting on the big boardroom table in the office? Or do you want to see me go to my other office? Because I, I have two offices in this house. I can shoot in the other, the other office that I do Wise Wealth Wednesdays. Um, let me know. As always, guys, I'll see you on Wise Wealth Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, every single week, every single Wednesday, the Wise Wealth Show. Wise Wealth Wednesdays, guys. And I'm going to finish with one last slogan that I always say, unlocking a wealth through you is only three levers away. Spend less, earn more, and maximize returns. Bye, guys. Cheers.